complete finished presentation done each time I talk. And I would have got there, but for last week I got invited to go and do some uh, interviews in, in New York. So that took four days out of my week and I simply haven't caught up. So this is path finished. Um, but what I want to talk about first of all is the sort of stuff you suffer through in conventional courses here, which is micro-founded macroeconomics. We were talking about that walking up here earlier. And it's been, this, this, when you look at what's actually going on, it's a drive to give solid foundations to macroeconomics, which is not a bad thing. It's a good motivation. Just that they made a complete mistake in choosing microeconomics as the foundation itself. And if you go and take a look at where this all came from, uh, this is a, a wonderful talk, well worth reading, uh, because it's completely extempore. It's obviously something which he said live, and then it was transcribed. So there's no filtering going. And this is Lucas, pretty much in, in completely celebratory mode. He's just become... Um, uh, president of the American Economic Association. He pretty much defines the profession. And it was quite a... Um, uh, the, there's one paper where he, he says that we've solved macroeconomic problems. The problem of depression has been solved and has been solved for many, many decades. So there'll never be another depression. That was about three years, two years before the financial crisis. Uh, this is a separate talk, but it's intriguing to see how he just says, we thought the whole other thing we had to do was to make macro consistent with micro. That, that was the objective. And there are many, many good reasons why that's a bad idea, but th these are my favourites. First of all, neoclassical micro is a series of myths. If you take a good look at the empirical data, you can blow holes through all the stuff you're being taught in micro. For a start, marginal cost doesn't rise. Uh, when you look at the... Uh, even surveys have been done of corporations and asking them, you know, what is your explaining economic concepts to them and saying what shape does your marginal cost curve have, they all tick, not they all, but between 80, between, between 89 percent, which is the smallest percentage of answers that anybody's got, and 95 percent of firms, which is more than the median result that come out of about 20 or 30 surveys that have been done, uh, they tick the box with either constant or falling marginal cost. Okay? And there's good empirical reasons as to why that's the case. Uh, one of the manufacturers, when he had the theory explained to him as to why economists thought marginal costs rise, he thought, he thought economists were being deliberately insulting and left-wing, criticising business. Okay? That was his interpretation. It seems so outrageous to suggest that engineers were so bad at designing factories that cost rose while they were going through production. He said, normally we design them so they reach maximum efficiency at maximum usage. So all the way out, we're going to declining costs. So that's, that's the first one. Forget the upward sloping supply curve. It doesn't exist. Secondly, individuals don't maximise utility. There have, been, there have been a few studies that have alleged to find that they do, including pigeons. Now, pigeons are supposed to be rational. That's all very good for pigeons. Uh, when I see one pigeon pulling out a, a pound note to buy something, I'll take it seriously. There was a very good study done by a German academic, Sippel, in 1997, or published in 1997, where he clearly, from my... I, I haven't met him. I'd, I'd like to meet him and talk over how the experiment was done, if he wants to, because I, I really don't know that he would want to do this, because I think he was trying to show the theory made sense by taking it with a small tutorial class, 12 students, and getting them to go through a very detailed exercise where they were given price and quantity uh, patterns and income patterns for... Eight, eight commodities, basically, okay? just eight commodities, and given incentives to choose the combination that most, uh, would they most liked, a number of incentives, and they, they've, 11 of the 12 completely violated what are called the axioms of revealed preference. Okay? And then you try it with 30 and they violated it as well. So the, I can talk about the reasons as to why that happened, but that... Or the, you know, the whole utility maximising thing doesn't, doesn't describe what real people do. And finally, even if it did describe what real people do, if you take a whole bunch of individuals who have the classic downward sloping, what's called Hicksian compensated demand curve, you, if you aggregate them, you get any pattern you can draw with a polynomial. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean actual demand curves look like weird polynomials. It means conventional economic theory, which makes such a huge song and dance about supply curves on the one hand and demand curves on the other, can't even derive a market demand curve. Okay? So it's, it's a mess. It's, it's put across as something well put together by some of your lecturers, I'm sure. Um, they haven't read the literature. 
as thoroughly as you, as you can do. And the, the, the most important to me is the emergent properties. I mean, you, I mean, you can't derive macro from micro anyway. This is something physicists had known about for coming on to half a century. And there's an excellent, very literary paper by uh, Philip Anderson here from 1972 titled More is Different. And this is this part, there's a few extracts from that paper. He says, the behavior of large and complex aggregates is not to be understood in terms of a simple extrapolation of the properties of a few particles, let alone one which is the way neoclassicals started with uh, real business cycle models. Instead, at each level of complexity, entirely new properties appear. And understanding those new behaviours requires research as fundamental in nature as any other. So he's, what he was saying fundamentally came down to saying you can't reduce um, chemistry to applied physics. And he used the example you can't reduce uh, uh, psychology to applied biology. Well, you can't reduce macro to micro either. The same concept applies even inside economics. And then, of course, even if they were all right with all the other stuff, why did their models fail to see the financial crisis coming completely? My favourite remains the paper by the OECD, which was published, written in May and published in, I think, July of 2007. And here it's saying that uh, we're going to have... Uh, the current economic situation is in many ways better than we've experienced in years. Our central forecast remains quite benign. Now, this is the sort of stuff which is being presented to politicians in 2007, pretty much telling them 2008 is going to be a great, a great year. Get out there in front of the TV cameras and take credit for it, which, of course, politicians happily did and then found themselves being embarrassed as hell when the global economy starts to fall apart. And quite a few of those politicians did the best they could do to fob off questions from the media. That's what a politician is trained to do these days. And then went behind the curtains and bashed the shit out of the economists who gave them the bad advice. Not literally, so far as I know, but certainly figuratively. You told me this is going to be a great bloody year. Look what I've had to walk into, etc., etc. What the hell do I do? And the answers were, I don't know, what do you think? Okay? So they were useless at, at the most extreme crisis in capitalism since the Great Depression. And even after the crisis, some of them have started to amend their ways in various ways. So Olivia Blanchard was uh, at the, uh, in the OECD when he wrote this. And I, I still can't believe that... I, I remember literally when I, this paper actually first appeared because it was published in a journal in 2009, but he put it up as a working paper in a working paper archive in August of 2008. This is after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, okay? And the article was called The State of Macro, and his overall sum summary was, the state of macro is good. That's one year after the crisis began. A bit later, he started to change his mind, and he, he, he was, we've had a couple of conversations uh, in direct messages on Twitter, not, not many, but a few, so he's reasonable. You can actually have a conversation with him. Um, but he... he then wrote in this article a, a summary of what he got as responses from various people to a previous article. And here's this, uh, the, the, the starting point. Starting from explicit micro foundations is clearly essential because there's no, I can't see any other way to do it. Not because you can prove that micro foundations are vital and necessary, just that that's the only way they can think about doing it. And then he got some comments on this paper, including from me. And then he started with this summary. There's this wide agreement on the following three propositions. Let's not discuss them further and move on. Proposition one, macro is about general equilibrium. Well, I literally blanched. <laughs> that does not summarise what I said. Um, to me, it's about general evolutionary dynamics. And I want to talk about how you can do a macro uh, on that basis. You don't need micro. You, don't need the, you certainly don't need the micro you're being taught. Even a sensible micro, you wouldn't need to build macroeconomics. You might have some, you need some structural understanding of the economy, but micro as itself, forget about it. And it's actually possible to derive a fundamentally deep insight into macroeconomics straight from macroeconomic definitions. Now I'm going to get, this is fairly mathematical in what I'm presenting, um, so if I'm going too fast at some point, tell me to slow down. But it's just simply saying you can start from simple definitions, the employment rate. Now, the, the, beauty of the, the beauty of the foundation for macro is you want something nobody can disagree with. Now, I've said you can disagree with neoclassical micro till the cows come home. 
because there's so many things about it which are questionable both empirically, logically, and so on. But the definition of employment rate is pretty hard to disagree with, isn't it? Number of people with a job divided by the population. Wage a share of GDP. The wage, level of wages divided by, uh, by GDP. And the private debt to GDP ratio, which is the point which I'm going to have to explain why I've got debt in there, because again, converting according to conventional economics, debt is not a, a significant macroeconomic factor. And I'll explain that and why it's wrong in a short while. But if I put those together and I combine them with a couple of other definitions, so um, you, you would have seen the term labour productivity. I don't think there is such a thing. I prefer to call it the, labor, the upward to employment ratio. I'll explain why in discussion later, if you like. Uh, but that's defined simply as output divided by work, uh, output per worker. Okay? And the capital to output ratio, again, is the ratio of the measured value of, of capital, which is, I hope you know has a big question mark around it, how you define the number of machines you have. It's not straightforward. It's something which was a major, major part of post-Keynesian and Sraffian economics was working that out. But strictly speaking, once you've made a definition, it's the, the accelerator, what we also call the accelerator, is the ratio of measured capital to measured output. Now, if you differentiate those respect to time, uh, it's quite a simple process to go through because if you, if you have a, a definition where you have something which is a ratio, and all those are ratios, so 1 over x, x divided by y, uh, times the differential of x divided by, that's the percentage rate of change. So I'm just looking, working at the percentage rate of change in mathematical terms. And you can simply break it into two bits. If you have x divided by y, then the, the rate of change of the ratio, the percentage change of the ratio is the percentage change of the numerator minus the percentage change of the denominator. Basically very simple. And equally, if they're multiplied by each other, then the, the percentage rate of change of the product is the percentage range of change of one plus the rate of change of the other. Very, it's a very simple principle. When you apply it here, what you get are those expressions. So the, rate, the employment rate is one over the, the percentage rate of change of the workforce minus the percentage rate of population. The wage share is the percentage rate of change of wages minus the percentage rate of change of GDP. The debt ratio, percentage rate of change of debt minus percentage rate of change of GDP. Very simple, okay? It's, in terms of actually doing the mathematics, it's about a, a couple of minutes of simple calculus. One, one of my old mathematics lecturers used to describe as money for old rope, okay? You just, literally this can be done by an organ grinder. And uh, now what you get out of that is three dynamic versions of those definitions, which are true by definition. So the employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of change in the output to labour ratio and population growth. And the wages share of GDP will rise if wages grow faster than GDP. That's doubly obvious. And the private debt will ratio, ratio will rise if, de if private debt grows faster than the economy. So you get three equations out of that. I'll just use the hat symbol is used by mathematicians to represent a, a, per, a percentage rate of change, not, you, not the, the fractional rate of change, 1 over x dx dt. So y, a, a lambda hat is y hat minus a hat plus n hat, the yada, yada, yada for the other three. Very simple. Now those are still definitions. If you want to make a model, then you have to make some simplifying assumptions. But these, what I'm doing here, is genuine simplifying assumptions. I had a, remember, one seminar. I'll be, I'll be writing this up when I put my, um, the next major book I'm working on out. I had a, um, a, a very young and enthusiastic recent PhD neoclassical graduate. Uh, I saw him in a, a conference at the Western Economic Association, and I thought it's going to be fun if he comes to my session which it was, he sat in the front row and as I continued talking, he was getting more and more agitated and finally couldn't help himself. This is after the financial crisis, by the way. And blurts out, but, 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 but you're assuming everybody's an idiot. And I said, well, did you see the financial crisis coming? He said, no. I said, well, on your definition, you're an idiot. Why shouldn't I model the world of consisting of people like you? He didn't appreciate that, of course. And walking out, he's trying to argue with me after he left the seminar, and he said, he shouted out to me as I was walking away, well, we have to make some simplifying assumptions. And my reply was, mate, you've got to learn the difference between a simplifying assumption and a fantasy.
Okay, unfortunately, they haven't done that. So I'm going to make a couple of simple forward applying assumptions here that there's a constant rate of change of labour productivity. So I'm using alpha for the percentage rate of change of, of the labour to output ratio. And I'm using beta for the percentage rate of change of population. Now, that's a simplifying assumption because whatever it might be, if you put it in functional terms, that constant is the first term in a Taylor series expansion. Okay? So you can fit anything with the Taylor series or Maclaurin series, you know, or if you're working, if you're doing a Fourier series, you can break something down to its simplest components, and the very first stage of that simple component is those terms. A constant layer output of capital output ratio. It varies, and I've now got a better explanation as to what that is than just a ratio, but I'll leave it up for a moment. And a uniform real wage, a uniform profit rate, uniform depreciation rate. And I then have linear functions for the rate of change of wages as a function of the employment rate, so what you'd call a Phillips curve, but it's linear. And a linear investment function, which relates the percentage of GDP devoted to investment to the rate of profit. So the wage change function has, is a simple linear thing. That's the, the slope of the function, that's the value of employment, and that's the value at which there's no wage change. Okay? This is the investment function uh, for gross investment as a fraction of GDP. That's the slope of the function. That's the actual profit rate. And that's the point where capitalists invest exactly earnings, rather than no more, no less than earnings. And then I have credit financing uh, invest, gross investment. And I define, there's a lot of confusion in terms around monetary concepts because economists don't understand money. So they use all these terms without even thinking about it. For example, they use credit for debt and you'll actually find things like the Bank of International Settlements defines debt as credit. Now, that leads to a few errors, and one of the, one of the leading neoclassicals uh, dismissed the importance of private debt as a causal factor for the crisis because he said, look at credit. It hasn't, it's, yes, it's, it's, credit was um, peaked in 2009, but in 2010 it's much the same level it was in 2008, so it can't possibly be a causal factor. What he was talking about was the ratio of private debt to GDP, which had peaked before the crisis, during the, after the crisis, and fell after that peak. And he was using it as if it was the rate of change of private debt. Now, it was equivalent to twice GDP. So he, he got past him and the referees in the Journal of Economic Perspectives that if his term was correct, debt would have been growing at twice the rate of GDP every year. So it would be the ratio of debt, if that was the case, the ratio of debt to GDP would be 10 to the 30 times GDP with a matter of, a, matter of a, few, a couple of decades. So he, I want to define carefully, so I call debt the, the money you owe in dollars or pounds or whatever unit of currency you're using and credit as the rate of change of debt per year. So one is a stock, the other is a flow. A bit of long-winded, but I want to explain that. So I've got the rate of change of debt, which is credit, is equal to gross investment minus profits. So I'm looking here at, uh, I'm leaving out Ponzi investing. There's no gambling with the borrowed money and I haven't got any household debt. It's all corporations using it to build factories. Now what I get out of that is actually the simplest possible dynamic model of a monetary capitalist economy. And it's three dimensional and that matters in terms of uh, what's called complexity theory and chaos theory. Has anybody here read up on complexity theory? or chaos theory at all? A bit. Okay, I recommend you do a bit of reading. Um, that's what the, when, you, when you work with those terms and expand it out, this is what you get. It's a very simple model. And so there's... Um, GR stands for the real growth rate. And that's investment, net investment minus depreciation. There's IG, which is the rate of in, the investment percentage of GDP. That's the profit share. And that's the wage change function. So it's, it's quite simple as a model. Um, there's about, there are three variables in there and about eight parameters. So it's an extremely simple model. And it comes out, there are actually three equilibria. Only two of them actually mean anything because they're, one of them has got negative values. So one is a constant uh, where you have a, an, a with three constants. So the, the employment rate, which is positive, wage share of GDP, which is positive, and a debt ratio, which is positive. And there's another one with zero employment, zero wage share, 
an infinite debt ratio. And two of my friends in this area have, have called um, the, the good and bad equilibrium respectively. Now, I'm about to show you a bug in my Minsky software because this is supposed to be a nice looking graph. <laughs> okay? And so is this. So what I've got to do is run them in the program instead, which is over here. So that's exactly the same model I've shown to you beforehand, done as a flowchart in Minsky. The actual equations, Minsky generates them on the fly as you, as you do a, 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 a writer model. So those are all the definitions I've shown you beforehand. And this is how it looks in terms of a, a wiring diagram, which is a standard thing in what's called system dynamics. So that's the definition of the rate of profit. That's the definition of the investment rate. There's the growth rate. That's the wage exchange function. That's banker's share of GDP. And over here I have the employment rate equation, the wage share equation, and the debt equation. And I can simulate the model and change various factors in it as I, as I run the model. So if I now run this, uh, this is giving me the employment rate, the debt to GDP ratio, and uh, the rate of change of wages turning up here dynamically. And here I'm plotting the employment rate against the wage share of GDP and the employment rate against the profit share of GDP. And down here I'm modelling the wage share of GDP against debt and the profit share against debt. And everything's converging nicely. It's, uh, you know, it's neoclassicals don't work with models like this, but it's the sort of world that they think they live in where the equilibrium is stable. So you're going to converge over time to that equilibrium. You have a constant debt ratio, a constant employment rate, a constant level of wages, and a constant uh, growth rate for the economy. Okay? Now, that's with a low level of desire to invest by capitalists. What do you have a, a high level of desire to invest, which superficially sounds like a better situation? I'll stop it for a moment. Notice that the cycles are declining even faster than the previous simulation. But after a while, they stop declining and they start rising. That convergence is now becoming a cyclical divergence. Obviously, there's, when you compare the profit share of GDP to the debt level, the profit share is remaining constant over time. It's cycling around, around or near an equilibrium. But the wage share is declining. So workers, even though they do no borrowing in this model, are paying for the high level of debt by a reduced share of GDP going to them. Capitalists who are doing the borrowing are getting a constant share. Keep on going for a while, and ultimately you start getting enormous cycles that lead to a breakdown. And you may not have noticed, but the debt level is much higher in that simulation than it was in the previous simulation. Okay? Now, that's the simplest possible model you can build of a capitalist economy with money, starting from first principles. And if I wanted to derive it, I could do it in front of you in about half an hour. And what you've got is a great moderation followed by a crisis, which is what happened empirically. You have a high level of debt to GDP, which is what happened, and you have rising inequality, which is what happened. So inverting the whole thing, rather than trying to drive macro from ma macro from micro, throw micro out and drive macro from macro, your first principles model starts out pretty damn close to the real world. Now I can extend it to a model with prices, again the same way. I simply bring in prices as part of the model, so I now have Rather than just working in terms of real GDP, I have nominal GDP, which is real GDP times a price level. So I'm making a simplifying assumption again of a, a single price level, and I've only got a single commodity inside there. But I now get a modification to those in the statements I gave you earlier. So the only change is the second two, the wage share of output will rise if money wage demand, so I'm not talking in money terms, exceeds the sum of inflation plus, plus growth in labour productivity. Or, labor output ratio. And private debt will rise if the rate of growth exceeds the sum of inflation plus the rate of economic growth. And again, using that same hat terminology there, that's the only change I have to make to move across to that model. Now, I'm going to be a bit um, uh, painful in the next couple of slides because I'm going to go through what that price level is. Again, you can derive that from first principles. But 
Um, so I, I need a, a pricing model, and I'll show you how it's derived in a moment. That's going to be pretty hairy. Nominal interest rates, because at the moment I've just got a fixed real interest rate inside. Well, I need to make that modified for the rate of inflation. And I can bring in a government sector, again by the same idea, bring in the definition of GDP, including government spending and taxation, and then do uh, models for those. And you can bring in the fact that production is multi-sectoral as well. Okay? All those extensions are feasible. I've done them all in different papers. So what I'm going to do here, this is a bit hairy, and I've just fixed it up as I've been... This is what I wanted to get done four days ago, but I, I lost the time. You need a price mechanism now. And when I first tried to do this, there is what's called Koleski's markup pricing equation, uh, which is largely derived by Koleski on the basis of what he called the degree of monopoly. And I, I, I think the equation's correct, I, but I, I don't like imposing anything I can't derive from my own modelling framework. So I resisted using it for ages. And then in trying to find out how can I actually derive an equation without using, um, like imposing a, a pricing equation, I remember how frustrated I thought, I've got to use bloody supply and demand. Okay? But I used a flow of supply and a flow of demand, monetary supply, monetary demand. And it was dynamic, starts from a flow. So I began from this idea of a price mechanism where you have... Uh, the rate of, change, rate of change of prices is minus 1 over tau p. Now, what the hell does that mean? This is using a concept from engineering. And you'd be far better off learning engineering than economics if you want to do any decent economics. Because engineers, they get taught a high, far higher level of mathematics. They learn realistic assumptions. And the tools they've developed are appropriate for looking at a, the economy as a dynamic system. Not an evolutionary one, but a dynamic system. This is what's called a time constant. And uh, what, it's, what it's saying, the reason for putting it in, in a fraction there is that you can use a, a raw number for it as well, but the, ta the T, the, the tau P there, stands for the number of years that it'd take to fall to a, a target value. So um, if you have, um, let's say, have like one there as the value, saying that means one year, and saying prices will converge to equilibrium over a year. Okay. I'll use it again later, but it's, the, 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 the format looks strange, minus one over something, rather than just putting an, a number in front. If you use the number, it's inverse time, which is not an easy thing to get your head around. If you use one over, it's time. So you know the tau p is, if you say, how fast do prices converge? Let's say a year. Okay, use one as your value. How fast do they converge? Five years? Okay, use five. So it's Strange when you first see it, but it's much easier to interpret once you get, get your handle of it. Now, if supply in this particular mechanism, if the monetary value of supply, so the price times quantity, is greater than the monetary value of demand, which is actual wages and profits being spent to buy goods and services, then this is going to cause prices to fall back towards equilibrium and vice versa. If demand's greater, then prices will rise. Okay? That's the idea of the mechanism. Now, I can expand this and say, well, the monetary value of supply is the price level times output. And then output itself, I can break down into labour times the labour output ratio. And labour, I can say, is the wage bill, total wages, divided by the money wage. Okay? There's all the simple uh, substitutions. And the money wage is a fraction of total money income so I'm saying 1 minus S goes to workers and S goes to capitalists. Okay? A set of simple breakdowns there. So I do a substitution. So I get that. I'm now bringing all those terms inside here. So this is all just a set of substitutions. And then because we're in a monetary economy, demand-driven economy, monetary demand is equal to monetary GDP, nominal GDP. And in equilibrium, okay, the equilibrium money supply or the equilibrium money price or money, money demand. So I substitute that inside here and I've now got an expression. There's monetary demand is equal to the equilibrium price multiplied by one minus, by the worker's share of money, of money, uh, money value of GDP divided by money wages multiplied by the labour output ratio. Solve for all that stuff and I finally get the equilibrium price is one minus the worker's share multiplied by money wage over labour productivity. That's Koleski's markup pricing equation. So what I found ironically was I resisted, I resisted using Koleski because I didn't want to just impose something. 
was pissed off that I had to use supply and demand, but I did it in monetary and dynamic terms, and bang, they're the same when you resolve them. Um, that's one thing I'm writing up for this paper in, uh, in, in uh, Hungary and also in Milan in a couple of weeks' time. So that's, that's the price up, markup pricing equation. Now, in dynamic terms, they fit that into the convergence mechanism, and I get this arrangement because if, that is, if, if pr actual prices are greater than the equilibrium prices, this is negative, it's going to go back towards the equilibrium. So it's using it as a stabilising mechanism. And I can then rewrite this in terms of the wages share. I know this is getting pretty hairy, OK? You thought you were getting away from a lecture. You're copying one after 7 o'clock, but still. OK. So I go through doing all those substitutions, yada, 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 and I finally get the equilibrium price stated in terms of the current price and the worker's share of GDP. Now, this becomes relevant because one thing we have to explain, one thing you might be getting in your macro lectures, is why a wage rise is so low these days, why price is low, why a wage rise is low. In this model, it turns out that a, a rising level of private debt causes a fall in worker's share of GDP. Okay? Now I put this into the equation to get an inflation expression, and I finally get this thing here. Pardon me, we go back up for one up here. Um, so I've now got the rate of inflation expressed in terms of the worker's share of GDP. And if this has got a negative trend, then so will inflation. And this has a negative trend with rising debt. So again, a very simple model, this is still quite simple, derived from first principles of macroeconomics, tells you more about the real world than any neoclassical macro, the, the, the most advanced neoclassical model won't tell you as much about the planet as this model does. Now, there's another disaster. This is the graphics hassle, so let's take a look at that um, in the full term. This is that same model in Minsky. Now again, I know this stuff looks horrific when you first see it. I'll just drag over here and explain the logic. So this is saying, ah, I didn't want that to happen. Right, okay. There's gross investment in real terms. Sub, 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 subtracting depreciation gives you real investment in net terms. Integrate that, you get the capital stock. Divide that by cap the capital output ratio, you get real output. Divide that by labour productivity, you get how many workers are hired. Divide by population, you get the employment rate. Feed that into a wages change function. A model played by the nominal wage, you get an integrate, you get the, real, the current wage. Model played by labour, you get uh, wage, the wages bill. Subtract that in interest payments from output, you get net profit. Divide that by the value of capital, you get the profit rate. Feed that into investment function, you get gross investment real investment, um, and if that value, the value of real investment in money terms exceeds uh, money profits, you've got to borrow money, and if you borrow money, you've got to pay interest on it, okay? And then all the rest is just defining the logic of that, of that uh, system. So I'll just uh, change back to full scale. That's the whole monster there, and let's just simulate it. And again, this is the, just a third stage model. There's a lot further that can be done to push this further and see what happens with it. Now, what you get for a start is a system that's cyclical. You've got booms and busts going on there. You have a rising debt ratio. You have a declining rate of inflation. You have a falling wage a share of GDP. Notice the profit rate looks nice and stable. Okay? Stable but cyclical. You then go on to a period of increasing cycles. You see the cycles getting bigger there. Still a rising level of debt. The interest rate is now down at the floor. I've got a, I have, don't allow a negative interest rate. They're given the current behavior of central banks. Maybe I'll have to in future models. Then the cycles seem to die out. And capitalists in particular think everything is nice and stable. What they don't realize is that their, their profit uh, the, the re remainder of the GDP after their profit is going to workers on the one hand and bankers on the other. And they basically couldn't give a, a brass razoo as to who it goes to. What's happening over time with a rising level of debt, it's coming at the expense of workers. Workers have now technically so weakened that they're now accepting the maximum rate of wage cut they will accept. The if dynamics I've shown you on deflation have hit, so you've now got falling prices as well as a positive interest rate. And suddenly, 
the debt charge they're paying to capitalists overwhelms the reduced amount they're giving to workers and the profit rate plunges. And goodbye capitalism. You can see in the income shares down here at the end, everything is going to bankers. Which I think, outside government uh, intervention and bankruptcy, that's the world we fell into. Okay? And all that's been done relatively simply, without all the complex nonsense you've got to go through to build a neoclassical model. Now, you can add a government sector to it, you can have multi-sexual production inside there, and so on. None of this has been built using micro. Micro is a waste of time. And as I said, a set of fallacies. Again, repeat this. There's, there's actually my favourite paper on this is actually written by an ex uh, uh, vice president of the American Economic Association and an ex vice president of the Federal Reserve, Alan Blinder, because he's part of the new Keynesian school. And part of the new Keynesians were having these huge battles with Lucas and Co. from the real business cycle mob. Uh, their argument was price, prices are sticky, but they had to have an explanation as to why they were sticky. So you got a large research grant hiring a number of PhD students to go and interview uh, a number of corporations in the north, uh, the northeast quadrant of the United States, around, the, around Boston and so on. And he finally worked out that his students had interviewed a number of corporations whose collective output was equivalent to 15% of America's GDP. Okay, so we're not talking a small sample here. And overwhelmingly, the answer they got back was that marginal cost is constant or falling. Okay? The opposite of the textbooks. And chapter four of the book goes through his surprise at finding this. If he'd read any of the post-Keynesian literature, he would have known that for the last 50 years. Because post-Keynesian economists, right back in the 1930s, in fact, began to do research like this and found that he, the actual nature of firms was totally different to what they had in the textbook. So post-Keynesian and neoclassical economics diverged in micro uh, starting in the 1930s. Again, the maximising utilities nonsense, you can't derive a downward sloping market demand curve. I'm happy to talk about those elements in, uh, in, later, uh, in the discussion later. But also, there's no money in neoclassical theory. Okay? So, um, why is the money not there? Well, I'll talk about that in a moment. Now, if with all this stuff, you have to work really, really hard to build a model, in, a, a DSG model in particular. It's extremely hard work. Um, but it doesn't tell you what happens in capitalism, and it leaves money out, except for one person, Michael Kumoff, who's about the only neoclassical model who understands money and happens to be a very good friend. Um, now, let's look at the, the, the money uh, issue as well, because, again, your macro doesn't include money. Why not? Well, because of the loanable funds model that says banks are just intermediaries and the money multiplier model that says the government controls the amount of money by manipulating uh, reserves plus the uh, reserve ratio. Now, in 2014, the Bank of England came out with this excellent paper saying that rather than banks receiving deposits and lending them out, bank lending creates deposits. Have you seen that paper yourselves? Worth having a read. Some of you have. Okay. And the Bundesbank, they almost fell. I, mean, I expected the Bank of England. Not, I didn't know it was going to come out, but I knew some of the authors of those papers, and I knew they were sympathetic to post-Keynesian approaches. So I was delighted when it came out. So it wasn't a complete surprise. I congratulated them on the paper, and I uh, had a bit of a laugh about some of the wheely, wheezy words they had to have there to not to totally annoy the Monetary Policy Committee. When the Bundesbank came out, I really could have fallen over. Okay, the the heartland of of um, Teutonic uh, pressure for austerity came out and agreed with the non-orthodox people that banks create money. And notice there's a popular misconception that banks are simply intermediaries. It's normally when you say a popular misconception, it's something that ex the public believes that the experts know is false. This is the other way around. A lot of the public thinks banks create money. It's the so-called experts who think they don't, neoclassical economists. Uh, and again, the Bank of England paper again about not the, the money multiply not existing, same for the Bundesbank. Um, now, I um, have learned a lot from uh, European academics involved what's called the circuit school theory, particularly an Italian economist, Augusto Graziani, who died a, a, about eight, ten years ago now. And he pointed out that if you're in a monetary economy, this is a beautiful paper I highly recommend reading, monetary economy has... Each exchange is not two people with two commodities trying to work out a relative price. 
it's two people, one with money, the other with uh, a commodity, and they're doing an exchange where the, it's a transfer of money from bank accounts. So you said all exchanges are triangular, which there was an enormous um, in, insight for my benefit in building the Minsky software I've done. And I can, what I want to now show you is that it's essential to have the idea that banks create money, which is the real world, as part of your macro. Because if you don't have banks creating money, then all the effects I've shown you beforehand don't happen. So I want to show why money matters, why credit's part of aggregate demand, and therefore by leaving out the banking sector from macro completely distorts macroeconomics. So this is what I call a Moore table, named after Basil Moore. And I divide the economy into three sectors, and it doesn't matter what the sectors are, so long as you're comprehensive, okay? Cover the whole economy. And on the, di on the diagonal, I'm going to show expenditure by one sector on the other sectors. And on the off-diagonal, that expenditure becomes income for those sectors. So each row must sum to zero. Your expenditure becomes somebody else's income. That is one absolutely solid principle of macroeconomics. Okay? And uh, misinterpreting that is a lot of what leads neoclassicals astray. Now, column sums can be non-zero because that's income, expenditure by on, on one element and income on the other two. So a sector's expenditure can be greater than its income or less than its income. Uh, and there's three possible monetary arrangements. One is where you can't lend or borrow at all, using money for transactions, but there's no lending, no borrowing. Loanable funds, the neoclassical model, where you lend money, and I show lending along the diagonal because if you think about, if you, how, if you bring lending into this model, how would you show it? If you showed it from the diagonal to the off-diagonal, which is how I showed expenditure, you'd be treating a loan as income. No, it's not. You don't pay income tax on a loan. Okay, so you've got to show it along the along the um, the axis instead, and then the real world where banks create money. So I bring in a fourth sector, which is the banking sector, and the banking equity has to turn up there as well. And what a bank does when it lends, its assets rise equally to its liabilities, or the banking sector as a whole. When a bank creates money, it creates a loan on its own on the asset side of its ledger, and a liability on the other on the uh, a deposit on the other side of its ledger. So here's the more table for the simple world where it's just a set amount of money and it turns over um, several, times, you know, one, several times a year. And A and B are flows of dollars per year. So that's expenditure by sector one on sector two and three. That's the income generated by that expenditure by sector one for sector two and sector three. Uh, and the sum has to be zero. That's income received by sector one from sector two and sector three. And that's effectively, if you were to work out what's going on, you add up the diagonal, or you add up the off diagonal and take the negative, that's expenditure, or you add the off diagonal and you get um, income that way. So that's aggregate demand. Okay? And if I take the, 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 what's called the trace of the matrix there and substitute that A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F is effectively the velocity of money times how much money is in existence, it's Milton Friedman. M times V, okay? That's the standard expression. Now, when you have loanable funds, this is the thing that Paul Krugman loves, uh, one sector lends to another sector, and then the other sector spends, I've got sector one, sector two lending to sector one. Sector one then pays interest, which is why sector two's done the loan in the first place. And because there's a flow of new loans, there must be an existing stock of loans. And then sector one spends on sector three. And I can make it more complicated than that, but I still get the same basic principle out. So now I've got credit and interest turning up in there. So there's a flow of credit from sector two to sector three. Nobody borrows for the sheer pleasure of being in debt. You borrow to spend. So you spend that credit on sector three. Okay. And then I go through and do the same exercise Credit cancels out. Okay? The increased expenditure by sector one comes at the expense of less expenditure by sector two. And they, it cancels out whether you're adding up the diagonal or the off-diagonal. But you get interest, and it's actually gross interest payments, a part of a nominal GDP in this model. So credit cancels out. And what that means is, if loanable funds describe what banks actually do, then it would be correct to leave them out of macroeconomics. Now, the real world, 
banks lend to non-banks. So I have sector one borrowing from the banking from the banking sector. Sector one spends on sector three and has to pay interest to the um, to the bank. So it's a more complicated table, and I've now got the everything that happens in the liabilities and the equity of the bank. So there's the creation of credit. So the loan creates the deposit at the same time. There's the expenditure of credit. Now you do the same exercise, and credit turns up as part of aggregate demand. Okay? And in the real world, of course, credit is incredibly volatile. Okay? Credit can go up very quickly, and credit, unlike turnover of existing money, credit can be negative. Now, since this describes the real world, you can't leave banking out of macro. But that's what they do. So I want to show the impact of that because here's a look at the level of private debt which, and the stock and the rate of change of private debt for America from 1834 till today. And I, of course, we all know um, about the, the, the Great Recession, as Americans call it. Australians call it the global financial crisis. You call it the fault of the Labor Party, don't you? Or something crazy like that. Okay. okay. Um, there's the Great Depression. I wasn't aware of what's called the Panic of 1837 until I plotted this data. Because what's going on, as you can see in each of those cases, is massively negative credit. There's the zero line. So anything below here, credit is negative. And there's a huge negative dip, another negative dip, and another negative dip here. And if you compare the pre-Great Depression period to the post-Second World War period, there's no negative credit from 1945 all the way out to that crisis. And that went from plus 15 to minus 5%. <coughs> this went from about plus 7 to minus 10 and stayed there for a substantial period. This went from plus 15 to minus 10 and stayed there for longer than the Great Depression. So I actually did a historical discovery by looking at this data. Now, neoclassicals will tell you, and Ben Bernanke says it explicitly, Pure redistributions, otherwise known as credit, should have no significant macroeconomic effects. That's the correlation of credit with unemployment in America, minus 0.85 since 1990. It's smaller in previous years. That's significantly different from zero, wouldn't you say? So you get a similar result for virtually every country in the world except Germany because its huge trade surplus and government austerity uh, count, means that people aren't borrowing money. In fact, they're reducing debt. But it applies globally. And also, when you look at the... That, that's looking at the unemployment ratio. It also affects the financial markets, including housing markets. So, uh, it, again, I haven't done the mathematics here in this presentation. But it's, simple, again, simple to derive a relationship showing change in household debt correlates with change in house prices, actually drives change in house prices. So what's caused the housing bubble, and that applies particularly to the UK, is too much mortgage debt. It's banks creating too much money for speculation on assets, which has caused overvalued assets. So I want to now illustrate um, the, why, why it matters to have a model in which banks are part of the system, because um, this, this is just an essential piece of logic to understand the role of money. And it's the reason I designed the software called Minsky. This is open source, by the way, so if you want to get a copy, uh, go to SourceForge. Look for Minsky, and you can download a copy. And I'll just give you... The, what it does is it lets you build monetary models of the economy. And what I've done here is build a model which is the neoclassical vision of loanable funds where one non-bank lends to another non-bank. And I'll bring up uh, two views of that. One is the, the banking sector's view, and this is the consumer sector's view. Make them a bit larger. So this has... Uh, the bank has assets of reserves, but no loans because, strictly speaking, in loanable funds, debt's not an asset of the bank. It's an asset of the savers. Okay? In this model, the consumer sector are the savers. They're the ones who lend money. The investment sector is the borrower. It borrows money from the consumer sector. Uh, so you have lending from the consumer sector's deposit account to the investment sector's repayment the opposite direction, interest payments the opposite direction, and the bank's in the action because it's charged a fee for introducing the, 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 uh, the savers to the borrowers. 
Now, when you, where, where's debt? Well, debt's actually down here as an asset of the consumer sector. So to lend money, necessarily, the consumer sector's deposit account has to fall and the debt level rises. And they equal the opposite direction. Repayment reduces debt and increases the amount of money in the consumer sector's deposit account. And then interest payments uh, 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 increase the equity of the consumer sector and paying the fee reduces the equity of the consumer sector. Is that reasonably okay to understand? What's going on down here, by the way, is hiring workers, uh, buying intermediate goods, workers consuming and bankers consuming. So it's just an accounting view of the world. And it's, does anybody here learn accounting? Okay, yeah. I didn't at the university. I learned myself accounting by building Minsky. Now I think I know it pretty well. So I think it's, we need to learn this to actually have it as part of the way we think about the economy functioning. Well, let's now look at simulating this model. So I've got a, over here my time constant for lending is seven, meaning roughly speaking, if nothing else happens, lending will double the level of debt in seven years. And I've got repayment being uh, nine, meaning roughly speaking, over nine years, repayment would halve the level of debt. Okay, that's roughly the way you can think about those terms. Not quite, they're ex exponential terms, but that's close to it. So I now simulate the model and what I get is an economy with no, no growth because there's no change in the nominal level of out, output, constant GDP, therefore, a rising level of debt, but no change in the money supply. Now, if I increase the rate of lending, so I reduce the time constant from 7 towards 5, watch what happens to the growth rate. It dips a bit. Nuts about the GDP. If I now slow down repayment, the growth rate dips even more. You've now got an accelerating level of debt compared to GDP. But really, bugger all has happened to the, to the GDP from a huge change in private debt. Now, if I now go reverse direction and repay more rapidly, there's a spike to the growth rate, but it disappears after a while. The debt level plunges, but again, not much has happened to GDP. So structurally, if this was an accurate model of how banks actually operate, yeah, you could ignore banks and macroeconomics, no problem. Okay? But of course it's nonsense. So let's just go back and I'll make this set back to the original <coughs> values there. Seven years for the rate of repayment and nine for the rate of lending. And come across to the consumer sector. And the, the offending column here is saying the debt's an asset of the consumer sector. That's loanable funds. Well, in Minsk, I can just delete that column and delete the operations that are associated with it. And I can go across to the banking column, the bank, banker's table, and make room for an extra asset there. And since I've deleted debt as an asset of the consumer sector, but it's still there as a liability of the investment sector, when I click that down arrow, it tells me any liabilities that haven't yet been allocated as an asset because one person's asset, another person's liability. So I click here, notice lend and repay are turning up in the investment sector but they're not turning up in the consumer sector or anywhere else. Now, if I click here, they turn up on the asset side of the banking operations. So those rows are now correct. Interest is, I've deleted interest. That hasn't turned up because I deleted interest going to the consumer sector. So I can simply say, well, interest is paid to the bank, and let's forget about the bank fee. Now, I've made no other change to the model. I should make other changes to make it more consistent, but I just want to show the impact of going from a world where banks don't lend money and create it to where they do. So start the simulation. You get a positive rate of growth. Rising debt causes rising money supply. If you increase the rate of lending, there's a boom. If you slow down repayment, the boom gets bigger. And if you go in the opposite direction and have slower lending and faster repayment, you have a slump. So it's a hugely significant aspect of the real world left out of mainstream economics. It's easy to bring it in to a, what you can generally call a post-Keynesian framework with a monetary model of the economy. So you go from an, an, a world where money doesn't matter at all to one where it's essential. And that's the, that's the impact of swallowing neoclassical economics. You lose a massive grasp on the real world in all sorts of ways. Now, I've been campaigning for reform of economics for 
going on close to half a century now. I started doing this when I was in first year in 1971. So I'm not very far from my 50th anniversary of being a rebel economist. Um, and I now think it's absolutely vital we get rid of this theory as soon as possible because they're quite literally likely to drive... If they don't drive the human race to extinction, they'll drive capitalism to extinction because they've applied the same nonsense ideas to looking at ecology as they've done to everything else. And I've read a lot of garbage in my time, but I've read nothing to compare to the nonsense in climate change economics by people like William Nordhaus. Uh, again, the fantasies they call simplifying assumptions. This, I call it the neoclassical disease now. You get so inured to making absurd assumptions, you can't even realise when you've made one, which is not just absurd, it's also crucial. If the assumption is wrong, so is your model. Okay? So it's vitally important to check to see whether the assumption is justified. And they have literally assumed that you can take GDP and temperature data today and you'll get a weak nonlinear correlation between the two and then say so that's going to tell us what's going to happen with climate change. And that's the basis of the IPCC coming out and saying trivial economic damages from climate change while the rest of us are watching you know, fairly serious crises evolving around the world. They're also using an equilibrium framework for something which is clearly not an equilibrium process. It's out of equilibrium. The fires in California and Australia right now are not equilibrium experiences. Okay? So all this stuff is completely wrong. And because they've given a, legit they've given a legitimate basis for delaying action on climate change, which I think has been crucial to the success of oil companies and coal companies in doing the same thing. So in my opinion, we either get a new paradigm for economics or we don't have capitalism anymore. And we can blame neoclassical economics for it. Thank you.